Part 4 The Multiverse The Ranforexian War The Last Days Battle of Halcyon All through that black night, Halcyte Ray Cannon sent bolts, stabbing out at the circling Thran fleet. Orange beams flashed into being and disappeared. Only occasionally did they strike a ship, and even then were too weak to destroy it. They only thumped hollowly and sent up vapor from heated wood. Still, these attacks kept the Thran fleet at bay. Meanwhile, Phyrexian mirror crews focused the moonlight to test their aim. Once the sun rose, beams of solar radiation would rake the battlefield and pop Thran ground troops like ants under a lens. The Thran were busy too. Crews spent the night rigging smoke vents at the prows of ships for thick smoke absorbed ray cannon blasts. Thran foot soldiers, meanwhile, polished their armors and shields to gleam like silver. Helms, gauntlets, shields, they would be mirrors scattering the sunbeams focused on them. Other soldiers dressed in black struggled across the nighttime desert toward the mirror rays. A few escaped notice and smashed portions of the array. Phyrexian guards, in turn, smashed them. The most secret crew of all was Halcyte, led by Yamoth aboard the war caravel, Yadagon. A large ship wreathed in sails, Yadagon circled tightly amid 63 caravels and 12 merchant ships pressed into service. Each was loaded to the deck with bombs. Each carried three implosion devices, some with crystals still hot from the mana rig forging process. There were also traditional powder bombs in massive supply. Last of all, filling up what space remained was quarried stone. Even a pebble falling four miles into the air could kill a man. A large stone could smash the power core of a ship. Yes, four miles in the air. No one flew that high. The air was so thin. Men faded and even died. It was so cold that all exposed skin cracked and froze in a matter of moments. Eyes bulged in their sockets. Brains bulged in their skulls. Madness and death ruled those heights. The Thran fleet would never expect Yamoth to rise above his own dome of defense and drop bombs in a ring on them. For hours, Yamoth's fleet circled tightly above the bejeweled city. They rose a little more than a foot per second. The glow of their engines was massed in bright flashes of cannon fire. The crews were told to stay on deck as long as they could stand it, to breathe deeply and let their bodies adjust to the thinner, colder air as they rose into it. When they could tolerate it no longer, they donned leather jackets and drew the hoods around their faces so that they could rebreathe their own air as much as possible. After that, they garbed themselves in the silver armor of Halcyte guards. The form-fitting suits had been modified to squeeze the wearer's legs and force blood up into their brains, the armor so rhythmically compressed and decompressed lungs. Even when that was insufficient, the crew were to retire below decks into sealed rooms where pots of water were boiled to help thicken the air. They were abjured to endure racking headaches by thinking of Halcyon and those they loved. They were commanded to channel their pain toward the Thran fleet laying siege below. It worked for most. By the time the Phyrexian fleet had reached an altitude of 20,000 feet, only a few hundred crew had fallen unconscious and only 33 had died. Yamoth did better than most. In Phyrexian's embrace, he had been transforming himself. Stronger muscle, thicker bone, sharper wit, lack of fear. From the flying bridge, nestled high beneath the wreathing sails, he relayed his orders through a speaking tube. Command the fleet to fan out in. Assign minutes of arc across the desert. Sail to assign coordinates. A flare over house sound will mark the fourth watch. In the glowing dawn, drop payloads. Since then, it had only been agonizing headaches, disease, nausea, drones on air so thin and cold that it could hardly carry sound. Yamoth had stayed on the flying bridge all the while. Peering past Yadagon's wreath of sails, he watched the faint ring of engines widen, pale red stars, among cold blue constellations. Dawn approached, gray below the east. Halcyon cast a dim shadow westward over the head of the Thran army. The Thran fleet drifted in a slow ring far below, just where they should be. If any Thran looked up, looked straight up, they would see the Phyrexian fleet glinting quietly among the fading stars. The fourth watch flare appeared over Halcyon. Yamoth's crew lifted ramps that held the gleaming implosion bombs. The devices tumbled overboard, one at bow, one at stern, and one amidships. Next, payloads of powder bombs rolled free, and then loads of gravel. The first implosion devices exploded below, an awesome ring of perfect gray circles, appearing where decks and rigging had been. Smoke from the powder bombs followed. At last, the sound arrived. A small racket here, caving hulls, staved timbers, failing plates, screaming soldiers. Those sounds were borne away by the manifold popping of smoke powder bombs, and they in turn, by the roar, of rock hailing down. Sounds lack. Yamoth watched the Thran fleet die. Ships rolled over. Fires belched from their decks. They spun. 
collided, grounded together, splintered, plunged. As they spotted towards the sands, doomed crew stared skyward. Yes. Look at us. Yomoth shouted, though every breath was precious. See the gods who slay you. Ship after ship crashed on the sand. Their power cores cracked. They imploded in a new series of blasts. Sand and splinters. Bone meal and blood belched up. A red cloud enveloped the whole fleet. It was easily enough done, Yama thought. From the cloud emerged Thran ships. Somehow vessels had escaped. Perhaps one in three. A hundred warships converged toward the city. They were sheathed in the smoke from the vents at their prows. Every ray cannon on the wall fired. Streamers of death jabbed from Halcyon. They struck the tightening ring of Thran craft. A few exploded or straggled downward. Most plunged on in their protective sheath of smoke. Down! Yama shouted through the speaking tube to his communication officer. Every ship! Down! Descend to engage! The prow of Yadagon dipped. The great caravel creaked in the thin, frigid air as it nosed toward the ground. Seams stressed open. Hisses sounded. Ghosts of steam emerged from the sealed chambers below. The stern pivoted, and the ship began a heady plunge toward the Thran ships below. Range! Yama shouted as he gripped the rail. Four miles and closing! The navigator called. The rest of the Halcyte ships banked from their positions and soared downward. Speed? 80 knots and accelerating! Intercept. Spokes of orange fire stabbed out from the city. They broke across the Thran ships. Most of the beams tangled with smoke sheaves, dissipating. A few cracked hulls, waking fire, and new smoke. The Halcyte fleet converged on the tightening hub of Thran fighters. If they get over the city, Yamoth muttered to himself. Time to weapons range. Three minutes! Increase speed! The engineer's voice came hollowly from below. I'd have to give the engines full power. Do it. We might not be able to pull up in time. Do it. Yadagon leaped down toward the Thran ships. Weapons range. In 30 seconds! Increase speed! Ready bow guns. Fire! Twin beams of orange radiance lanced out from the prow. The bolts seemed to struggle to escape the plunging prow. They roared out, twining in air, and fused into one great blast of energy. The bolt neared a Thran ship. A white puff of smoke rose lazily from the craft and spread thickly above it. The shot struck the cloud, sparking and leaping. It punched through the top layer of smoke, but the tiny particles plucked the radiance from the air. With a bright flash, the smoke cloud was spent, and the beam with it. Fire! Again the bolts jagged out. Again a puff of smoke dissipated them. That's how it will be then, Yama thought. His teeth were clenched in an expression half grimace and half grin. That's how it will be then. Increase speed. Prepare to ram. A hatch flung back. The engineer, a greybeard merchant turned warrior, emerged. He stared levelly at Yamoth. We will all die. You cannot order this. You are relieved of duty. Yelmoth said. He clamped down on the engineer's collar, lifted him, and with one swift and impossibly casual motion, flung him overboard. Increase speed. Prepare to ram. Rebecca and a passel of goblins sorted among the power stones in the mana rig's charging chamber. There were no other orbs cracked while the invasion took place. The mirror rays were needed to burn away Thran ground troops. Perhaps the stone Rebecca needed would be in this chamber. No, no, that's a dodecahedron, she said to the goblin beside her, who held a head-sized stone in his hands. A control stone has to be an icosahedron. Twenty sides, not twelve. Besides, that one is too small. The goblin casually let the stone drop among the others, scratched his head, and clawed through more shards. The regular solids were the rare shapes to come from a crystal orb, and large stones were the most rare of all. The floor was filled with pyramids and obelisks, lozenges and daggers but there was not a single icosahedron. Sighing, Rebecca let her hands flop. Let's try the storage chambers. They would not use a stone like that for an implosion device. Yamoth would have kept it aside. The goblins echoed her sighs. Look, I know this is a chore. I know if we get caught, we could be executed as spies. And if we don't do this, the whole city could die. Nodding their scabby heads, the goblins followed her into the dark vastness of the manor rig. Rebecca led them between smoldering furnaces in the towering darkness. This place had once been her husband's sanctuary, 
volcanism, and the heats of sun, scuttling goblins, and artifact creatures. This place had given birth to every great device in the city and to the Thysis. All the torments Halcyon had begun here, and here all the torments of Halcyon would end. The stone she sought was somewhere here, a control stone that could fly the Thran Temple out of this inescapable trap. Rebecca fondly patted a goblin on the head. It will be here. We will find it. And I will take you with me. Yadagon fell like a meteor on the Thran Corsair. The crew looked cringingly upward. Yadagon struck. Its steel-edged keel clove through rail and deck and hold. The Thran ships cracked like an ache. There was a shrieking moment when the sundered decks were even those of the Yadagon. Foes stared levelly into each other's eyes. Then, Yadagon plunged on through the Corsair. The two halves of the ship spilled away from each other. The thunder of shattering wood gave way to an eerie quiet. To either side of Yadagon, shorn sections of Corsair tumbled. Level out. Climb, Yalmoth shouted. The engines surged. Groans came from the hull. Yadagon sued sideways, dipped slightly, and then rose again through the rain of debris and smoke. An excellent whoop rose from the crew. Increase speed. Prepare another ram. Through the speaking tube, the navigator asked, How did you know our ship would hold together and theirs break apart? Simple physics, Yama said rapidly. The hull is a dome. A dome can withstand great pressures on its convex edge, but not its concave edge. His explanation was cut short by an orange blast from the city walls above. A ray cannon raked across Yadagon. The speaking tube and the navigator at its other end ceased to be. Amidships flashed away in a roar of flame and smoke. Charred remains bow and stern, spun crazily, spilling cargo and crew into the whirling air. Even as Yalmoth was thrown from the flying bridge and tumbled into empty air, all he could think was that he would find the gunner who did this and rip out his eyes.